Is that working now? Do I have to repeat all that or do you all hear me? <laughs> Mark's in Minneapolis, short version, has to take a test this week, so please lift him up in prayer. Um, I don't think he's been back to school since, well, it's been, it's been a minute, let's put it that way. So um, I do also want to point out that uh, tomorrow the United States Air Force is 76 years old um, and today is Constitution Day, hence the, the tie today. Um, but also, more importantly, it's Sunday. It's a day of worship. Thank you all for coming. I want to welcome you here. Um, if you'd please stand. <clears throat> we'll get ready to sing. I'm going to read from Jonah 1, verse 9. I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Let's sing.
Father in heaven, thank you so much for today. Thank you for this chance to come together and to worship you and lift up our voices in your praise. And Father, I just ask that you um, be with those that couldn't be with us today, be with those that are sick or hurting, and uh, just lift up those that are traveling. And Father, I just ask that you uh, be with each and every one of us and um, let us hear your message through uh, Kevin's words and the men that bring the meditations. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. You can be seated. And we are coming to the communion time already. So let's sing, Are You Washed in the Blood? morning. I'm going to start with a question, a little interactive and a demonstration. I'm going to try not to get hurt. Tell me what this is. Pretend it's not a soccer term. It's a basketball term. Pretend I have a basketball and I jump stop and I spin like this. What's that called? <laughs> That's right. Good job. <laughs> I had a direction in mind for this meditation and then I read Ken Ham and his weekly message and I had to that's right, because I thought his words were pretty powerful for our communion time. I had to shorten it a bit, but again, Ken Ham from Answers in Genesis. At a church conference once, a pastor was asked publicly, what would you do if you were the pope of the entire evangelical church? This pastor replied, I would ask preachers, pastors, and student pastors in their communication to get the spotlight off the Bible and back on the resurrection. Let's get people's attention back on Jesus as soon as possible, that the issue for us is always, who is Jesus, and did he rise from the dead? And that we would leverage the authority we have in the resurrection, as opposed to scripture. Now, what this pastor wanted to see happen in our churches is very different from what I have been seeking in all my years of creation apologetics ministry. My response to this question would be as follows. 
God's word warns us in 2 Corinthians 11.3 that the devil is going to use the same attack as he did on Eve to get people not to believe the things of God. When we go to Genesis 3.1, we find this first attack was on the authority of the very word of God. I call it the Genesis 3 attack of our day. The devil said to Eve, did God really say this first attack, which was successful, was to get Adam and Eve to doubt him and then not believe the word of God. We are warned by God's word through the Apostle Paul that the devil will use this same attack on us and our children and friends. The attack will be directed at the word of God. The devil is very clever. In a sense, he has been saying the following to the church. You can go on and teach your kids about Jesus and the resurrection and about miracles like walking on water, feeding thousands, healing the blind and the lame, and raising the dead. You can teach them about the miracles of the Israelites crossing the Red Sea and the Jordan River and of Jonah living in a fish for three days. The devil might continue. Yes, teach these Bible stories, but I'm going to attack the integrity of the word. While you may teach them the wonderful Bible stories, I'm going to work hard to get them not to believe the book the word from which these accounts come. And once they don't believe the book, they won't believe any of those accounts and their messages anyway. They are just stories, fairy tales, not real accounts. That's what I would tell them the devil might say. That's exactly what I believe has happened in the culture. Whether it's through the public education system, most kids from church homes attend government-run schools, the media, or even through compromised teaching in churches, the devil has been able to convince generations of people that the written word cannot be trusted, particularly beginning with the book of Genesis. Most hands in an audience go up when I ask if they have heard the following, who made God? This is a scientific age and science has disproved Genesis. Noah couldn't fit all the animals on the ark, so it couldn't have really happened. Where did Cain get his wife? Doesn't carbon dating disprove the Bible? Now, the apostles, Peter and Paul, would not have heard such objections to the Bible. They did not have to deal with such Genesis 3 attacks questions. In this era, however, the questions and statements above relate to the fact that the historicity of Genesis has been undermined for many generations. This generation is facing even more Genesis 3 attacks. By and large, government schools present ev evolution in millions of years as fact. Such teaching has resulted in many young people doubting and ultimately not believing God's word. Sadly, most Christian families and churches have not been teaching creation and general biblical apologetics. Because generations have not been taught to defend the Christian faith and thus don't understand, they can trust the word. They have also rejected the primary message of the word, salvation through Jesus Christ. Sadly, we've seen a generational loss from the church. At Answers in Genesis, we recognize that the focus of scripture from Genesis to Revelation is on our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's the most vital message in the universe for us to proclaim. Because of our sin, God's son became the God-man to pay the penalty for our sin by dying on the cross and being raised from the dead. But think about it. Where do we get the message of salvation and the message of who Jesus is and his resurrection? We find them in the written word. How do we find out about our need for salvation? From the written word. How do we find out what sin is and why we are sinners? From the written word. Many of our Christian leaders seem to be oblivious to what's been taught in the education system and media. They apparently aren't aware that as a result, increasing numbers in this generation do not believe the writings of Moses, particularly Genesis. They don't understand why we are losing teens and young adults from the church. As I've stated many times, this exodus of young people from our churches has already happened in England and much of the rest of the Western world. If you want to know where the United States is headed, look at England. One of the major contributing factors to this exodus is that much of the church did not teach apologetics and ignored or compromised with what kids are being taught at school concerning evolution and millions of years. They just kept on teaching about the resurrection alone. All the while, the devil was indoctrinating young people not to believe the book from which the message of the resurrection comes. More and more, we are finding that an increasing number of families and churches are using AIG resources and an apologetics approach to equip young people, and they are revolutionizing their churches and helping to stop the flood of young people leaving the church. I will never apologize for standing on the authority of the word of God. My father not only instilled the Christian worldview in his children from the foundation of God's word, but he also would research what the critics of the Bible were saying. 
and then he would give us answers so we would not doubt and disbelieve God's word. Ultimately, we all need to remember that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. In more than 40 years of ministry, I've strived very hard never to waver from an uncompromising stand on the word of God. And those of us who lead AIG all have the same burden. We will teach the message of Jesus, the resurrection, and the living word. And along with the psalmist, we will proclaim, I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Psalm 119, 16. I still remember the verse I learned as a child and what we taught our children. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Psalm 119, 11. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this day and for the efforts of people like Ken Han. More importantly, thank you for your son Jesus who was sent to take our sins. We are so grateful for his sacrifice that we may spend eternity with you. Please always help us to work to reach others and spread your word with gentleness and respect. And please bless all that partake in these emblems this morning. Thank you again for all the many blessings in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'd all please stand with us, we'll sing our offering hymn. Death was arrested. <laughs>
Good morning again. If you have been through already the Revelation study by Dr. Shane Wood, or if you're going through it, um, you'll find that one of the points that he made studying it uh, that is, among other things, what, demand, what God demands of his people. Now, obviously, Revelation is not the only book in the Bible that describes this. It is, I think, a major focus of the entire Bible. Of course, we should seek the answer to the question, what does God want from me? How does he want me to act whenever we read the Bible? And I think it's certainly an appropriate topic at offering time. I'll leave Dr. Wood's thoughts on that regarding Revelation specifically to the sermon series and the Sunday school sessions in these coming weeks. But I think that one of the simplest places to find the answer to the question is given by Jesus in Matthew 22, starting with verse 36. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment of the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. It's pretty simple. Love God. Love your neighbors. Okay, Bob, how? Well, Matthew 25, starting with verse 34, gives some insight to that. This is Jesus speaking. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, to, come you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the king, kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. You see, we love God by loving each other. What we do for each other what we, is what we do for him. There's a lot of work that goes into this once a week worship service, above and beyond the work that Kevin puts into his sermons. From the general building maintenance like cleaning, landscaping, mowing, etc., to service specific things like making and printing the bulletin, preparing communion, nursery workers, greeters, worship team, tech team, children's church, Sunday school teachers, giving meditations. All of that just scratches the surface of the ministry opportunities that exist to do for each other. Not to mention the monies that we collect at offering that are used in part to help our brothers and sisters ministering across the globe. At its simplest, God demands of us, his people, to love him by ministering to each other. Look around. Ask yourself, what can I do for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine? That's certainly an appropriate question to meditate on at offering time. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much again for this time to come worship you and to hear your word. And Father, I just ask that at this offering time, you uh, help us to see the things that we can do to love each other and to help each other and to minister to each other. And Father, I just ask that you uh, bless those that give today, bless the monies as they go to further your kingdom around the world. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Good morning. We are going to take some time to be praying, and I'm going to give you a heads up at some week in the near future, I don't know when, but instead of me asking you to give your prayer request to me so that I can repeat it to the whole room, I'm going to ask you to just share collectively in your little groups right where you're at. So just be ready, because I know that's going to be hard for you. But that's, and it's going, to kind of, it's going to kind of come when I feel like you're kind of grouped up in the right seating area. So just, you know, you stay spread out like this, you'd probably protect yourself. But just, just so you know, but just, just sharing collectively and just sharing with our church family kind of around us, you know, just, and so be aware of that. But for today, you know, I'll, I'll let you share if there's something, how, how can we pray as a church family? Elaine? She's 
not like she's at death's door or anything, but to help make her comfortable. So my mom's going into hospice, and she really needs to find a, a place to go that still feels like home. Okay. Okay, so you want to remember Elaine's mom and fall and broken vertebrae. That's, those are in the neck, right? C, two, three. Yeah, just looking for a place for hospice care that feels like home. Want to keep them in prayer? I will encourage you to, to take a moment, just spend some time praying personally, silently, and then I'll close. We praise you, God, for your word that has endured for opportunities to uh, read it and understand what it is that you require. And we are grateful for your many gifts that you have poured out to each of us uh, individually, to us collectively. Uh, we are mindful of the origins of our nation and, and the foundations uh, upon which it was established. We are aware, Father, that we will have opportunities this week to love uh, one another, to show our love for you in the way we reach out to interact with, uh, speak to and love community, neighbors, classmates. Father, we are praying that our time here would continue to be a source of strengthening and encouragement that we would uh, better understand your word each day, whether we're reading it collectively or individually through the week. We're grateful for all that has been poured into this service this morning. We pray that our time would glorify you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. And with this title, I have the architectural cohort. Uh, we're going to use this term cohort, which is from the collegiate ranks. The definition that I'm using uh, simply stated as this, an academic cohort consists of a group of students working together in the same program. They are progressing through the same academic curriculum, and they're finishing their degree together. So that's who we're going to be today. We are going to be a cohort of collegiate students, however far back some of us have to travel to college days. Architecture is our major. <clears throat> and our focus this week as we're looking at this book of Revelation is on its structure or its design. Architecture has just, to me, always been one of those things that can go a million different directions. Um, I'm going to give you some visual examples of what, to me, are like more typical structural designs. Like, here's a house. And to me, that's, I like it. You know, it's a seemingly normal house. Here's an office and then a skyscraper. And to me, I thought those are kind of in the realm of more than norm. I tried to find some that for me were out of the box. Here's a house with a little bit different design. Um, this office building is very unique. Um, and then this skyscraper, which from, from everything I've found is currently only exists on paper. Okay, they're, they're still trying to figure out the plausibility of that one. Um, and as far as local unique buildings, we would, many of us, point out the Longenberger office basket. You know, kind of a unique structure. You know. <clears throat> While we're talking about architecture, design, uh, we are very grateful for your continued prayers and financial support for the building of the seminary building in Myanmar, where Lazarus Fish ministers, and we have sent monies and efforts to help raise that building. And here's a, the picture that we often use. It, it's somewhat typical, I think, on the outside. And what I'm going to run through now for you are just some screenshots of the latest video that Lazarus posted online on his Facebook page, just so you can kind of see a little bit of the current progress. We'll have him, he's walking up the stairwell. So here's the first thing with all the safety features that you'll see um, in the stairwell as they're constructing. Uh, these are some of the columns of bracing that they use when they pour the next floor and they just fill it with all of those support columns. Um, it's going to be a five-story building. They get the cement up to the top with a winch and a bucket, a uh, five-gallon bucket at a time, comes up in that basket. And then they carry that on their shoulders and pour it into the form. Uh, by hand, you see a guy on top with a little wooden chute. Um, here's a kid, a construction worker with his cell phone holder right there. So, um, And then here's a picture of the students who are eating. 
at the top of whatever floor that is, you know, like if the third floor is finished or the fourth and, and they've taken the students up there to have dinner. So, and I'm gonna use those screenshots that I just showed you as like the backgrounds tinted yellow to just kind of keep us in the heavenly frame of mind. You know, architecture, design, um, how is this book structured? And, I'm, and I want you to know, we, we're referencing Dr. Wood's 11 sessions, and I'm only covering number seven this morning. I, initially, I was gonna do seven and eight, and I asked, I asked Denise last week, I said, so what do you think so far? And she just said, it's a lot which is, I understand that. Um, I, that made me think of burritos. <laughs> when, when I eat burritos, I don't like it so full that all stuff squirts out the back. That's just, I, I don't appreciate that. I'd rather have two little burritos and keep them all nice and tight so nothing goes all over. So I, I, wanna use, I wanna use all our time. It's the same amount of time, but just focus on the one aspect from seven. And you can, anybody can watch session eight at any time. If you're following along with us in our Sunday school, we will watch session eight in its entirety on October 22nd. Um, Dr. Wood is gonna go over the prophecy main points, which he made, which Bob is alluding to this morning. Um, he'll cover those in session eight, the two witnesses in chapter 11, uh, the olive trees, the lamp stands, 144,000. Um, so you can still get that. that. To me, those are like the specifics, you know, the, the, the blueprints, the engineers, the, the contractors are looking at the details. For us, from the, from the broader or the, you know, the higher view of the audience this morning, it's just more general overview, which I still think is, is tough enough. So we kind of got this architecture building from the ground. We'll start with the foundation, kind of basic level for this, uh, the footing. What is the structure of the book? Yeah. And before we stay on the architecture thing, leave that again for one moment and think about the opposite sex. Okay. Are, are, are you able to figure out the way they think? Um, I don't know if you've ever just like been at a loss. You, you are staring at this person of the opposite gender in disbelief. <laughs> you just, you're like, well, what's going on in there? I'm like, you're, what structure? You're just looking at the back of their head going, how is that thing wired? You know, it's like, how do they think? And this is an example. A uh, lady says, shortly before our 25th wedding anniversary, my husband sent 25 long-stemmed yellow roses to me at my office. A few days later, I plucked all the petals and I dried them. On the night of our anniversary, I spread those petals all over the bed laid down on top of there wearing a negligee, and as I hoped, I got a reaction from my husband. When he saw me, he shouted, are those potato chips? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Re Re Revelation has a, a different, a peculiar structure to us mostly unfamiliar, okay? The organization, organization. If, if you were to outline, try to outline the book of Revelation like 1A, 2B, that's just, it's pretty much impossible. And I preach that way every week. It's, I write that way in my outlines. You know, I, point A, point B, point C. I, you know, I even intended this sermon to just have one point, but it doesn't. You know, <laughs> it has four, just like I always, it's very hard for me to think differently. And I catch myself giggling at the way Lazarus Fish in Myanmar, how he uses our language, and sometimes some of the music that he puts behind, he thinks this will fit it with the Americans, and I, and I just kind of chuckle, and we're like, that, that's not how we use that song, you know, that's not, but I got to back off, because um, he's way smarter than me, <laughs> um, he's communicating all this stuff in another language, <laughs> I get that, I can't even begin to speak his native language, um, my grasp of foreign language goes about as far as mi lapis es azul, <laughs> which is, my pencil is blue, in Spanish, you know, that, that, I remember that. Um, Lazarus is not from here. Um, he's, he's not a Westerner. Uh, he uses our language differently. John is not from here. You know, he, he thinks differently. He, the author of Revelation, the Apostle John, is not American, he's Jewish. He's, he's not English, he's thinking cyclically. And I'm trying to give you those couple of graphics up there. Just to, there's a lot of scripture and Jewish thought. Point A, point B, point C, point D. Point D again, different way. C again, B again, A. Back to the beginning. It may come out, 
and go back. I tried to create a, a sample paragraph here in, in our language. This is my example regarding the river rock, the stones that are out here in our landscaping. First sentence. I think the stones in the beds, the entrance, were a good choice. There have been way fewer weeds this summer than in years past. We did add some touches of color with plants and pots. And most of the stones, even the ones on the slopes, have stayed put, which was part of our concern. Okay. Only a few stones have shifted and kind of rolled down the hill. The pots do still require watering and maintenance, and, and that's part of the challenge. Um, a few weeds have appeared. I've pulled some. Other people are weeding. They're pretty easy to take care of. You know, in the end, I, I commend the leaders. I think that was a good choice. You know, it's, it's a cyclical paragraph. It's a recapitulation. Recap. Let's, let's go back over what we just said. You'll get that in the news. Let, let's recap the news, and they'll catch you up with different details. If, if you've seen the movie, the movie is called Vantage Point, and this is how the movie cycles. It rewinds several times and looks at the same sequence of events through someone else's point of view. And I'm going to show you just a compilation of a couple of the rewinds, but this is how the movie literally... Soon the clock will reset, and they'll go back again. And our count will stop there. And, I, and honestly, I thought about maybe not using the clip, because some of that's graphic. You know, some of it's violent. Uh, revelation can be graphic. Um, they talk about a war. There, there's a war being <laughs> raged at the heart of Revelation. That's graphic. But that, that movie is an example of something that is arranged cyclically. You know? And Revelation's arrangement cycles through. And, and yet you read from chapter 1, 2, 3, you read it through in linear progression to chapter 22. Comes right up to the end of the world six, seven times and then comes back. Um, has several series in the book. You'll read like, first there are seven seals. And then there's a series of seven trumpets. And then there's seven bowls. And it always goes one, two, three, four, and comes back to the beginning. Um, in chapter 6, if you have the text open, chapter 6 is where they start opening the seals. And by chapter 8, they open the seventh seal in verse 1. And we talked about that last week in Sunday school. There's chronology there. They open the first seal and then the second seal. They don't jump around first, sixth, second, seventh. It goes one, two, three, four. And same thing with the trumpets. You know, and, and if you can see in chapter 8, in the beginning of chapter 8, we have the end of the seals, and then he moves to a series of trumpets. You know, and that, that's how the book is structured. Come back, let's look at it from another angle. First trumpet, second trumpet, third trumpet. And, and in those series of seven, between six and seven, you have an interlude. There, there's a break. There, there's a pause. You know, and that's just John's writing. Okay, let's go back and, and let's cycle back and give you a new vision. Um, like, like that movie, that Vantage Point movie. It says, here's how it, everything looked through the eyes of the secret service agent. Okay, now let's cycle back and we'll show you how this same scene unfolded through the eyes of the tourist, the guy who just happened to be there with a camera in his hand. Okay, now let's cycle back and et cetera, et cetera. You know, so that's, that's the foundation. Now we're going to build up a little bit on this construction theme, like, like the middle floors uh, symbolically representing here. here. Here's a couple of keys or tips, tools. If I'm going to try to identify, because this structure's unfamiliar to me, two things I can do. One is look, one is look for dialogue. And this is a good example of action movies. This happens to me. I don't know, but uh, Marvel movies, uh, the Disney Plus stuff, it's just, it's fast paced. You know, you get in these action movies and it's just, it's this big long car scene and a chase and explosions and big battles and Revelation has all that big picture stuff. And, and sometimes it goes on for a long time in the movie and I start losing track of who's who. You know, and, and Derek will say, did you see that person over there on the side? I'm like, oh, I didn't see him at all. You know, he's like, oh, that's important. You got to remember. And, and so you look for, and I long for, these dialogue breaks. 
You know, where it's just two characters and they're sitting down together in an office or a coffee shop or they're on the phone and they just talk. And I can kind of get caught up on who's on what side. And I don't, I don't want to give too much away from Secret Invasion as a series, but it just, it just had an illustration of this. Uh, we just watch it. Now, th- this is two female characters talking, okay? And they're talking about two guys. But this is their conversation between the two girls. Yes, well, let's be sure not to repeat the mistakes of Talos and Fury and leave love and friendship out of this. I will use you and you will use me and together we'll make this planet safe for both our people. No. Now, I could follow that. That was very clear. What, what the, I appreciate the dialogue, conversations like that. In Revelation, like chapter 19, here's an example. If you have the text available on your Bible or your phone, there's black uh, Bibles in the racks there in the chairs. If you want to look at chapter 19, John has this larger-than-life, giant movie screen vision. You know, this great multitude in heaven. All, and there's lots of shouting, um, like verse 1. There's smoke that's coming up in verse 3. Um, there's sounds like thunder. It's just this huge, loud, big movie screen scene. It's it's immersive experience. And in verse 9 and 10, dialogue break. Then the angel said to me, Right, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, These are the true words of God. At this, I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, do not do it. I am a fellow servant with you and with your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. You know, that, I, I can sympathize with John. I, we're human beings. Dr. Wood said we are made to worship. You know, sometimes we'll just look for the nearest. And here's all these angels and creatures and all this incredible stuff in heaven. And you just want to worship. You know? um, Sometimes it's the first thing that catches your eye, a celebrity. You know, Taylor Swift has Swifties everywhere. Um, you know, the uh, cars. People worship. City of Rome. So, so the, the angel says, not me, God. Worship God alone. And the dialogue clarifies one, one of the central points. You got all these angels and beasts and scene. Worship God. Here are all these cycles. Keeps coming back, coming back. Dialogue helps us. Here's what John's trying to show. Worship God. Uh, another key is, most scholars, folks agree, something unique happens in chapter 12. Okay. We just talked about going, going through this cycle, come back to the beginning. In chapter 12, you know, something different, because you have all those sets of seven things, the seals and the trumpets and the bulls, and they go back to the end of the world, and then they come back, and they're very parallel after you process in chapter 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, you process all the seals. And then in 8, 9, 10, 11, you go through all the trumpets and you think, all right, we're ready for the bulls. So they don't go there. The bull, we don't get to the bulls until chapter 16. You've got something different in, in chapter 12. Introduction to, and Craig alluded to a little bit in the, the, the devil, the dragon, Satan. Yeah. If you stayed for class last week, Dr. Wood was pointing out, you have a pregnant woman in chapter 12, verse 5. She's going to give birth to somebody who, the text says in verse 5, will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. If you knew the Old Testament story, if you knew the prophecies, if you say, well, that sounds like Psalm chapter 2, verse 9, you will rule them with an iron scepter. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. That's what we said last week. I've got to spend some time, some time reading the story, the Old Testament story, so that I can figure out the parts and the pieces. And he will tell you in the class we had last week. So the pregnant lady, on some level, the pregnant lady is Mary, and the dragon's trying to destroy her child, chapter 12, and he misses his opportunity. And if you have chapter 12 open, you can look at the end. This is verse 17. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring, those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Welcome to our world. You know, <laughs> that, that, would, that would be us. And then chapter 13 opens with this. It says, and the dragon stood on the shore of the sea. This is different. You know? Ch- chapter 13, you got the dragon and he has these two helpers. And we'll illustrate this on the screen. What's that kind of look like? You got the dragon, you got the beast from the sea, and the beast from the earth. Does that remind anybody of anything? Does that look anything like the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit? Well, we have the Trinity. 
You know, you've got a beast from the sea, and if you study him, he has what appears to be a fatal wound, but he's overcome it. It's like, does that sound like anybody that was fatally wounded and overcome? You know, you've got the beast of the earth who's exercising his authority, breathes life into this idol. It's like, breath, oh God, does that sound like anybody? Like, Holy Spirit? You've got here, you've got the unveiling of basically an unholy trinity, a parody. We'll, we'll try to imitate or mock the trinity. And both of these trinities have a people. When you go to chapter 14, the unholy trinity, their people, that's Babylon. Everything that Satan's trying to accomplish, all the evil that he's pouring into, it's always fed into this unholy city and these unholy people, and it's Babylon. For God, his people, what are we called? New Jerusalem. 312, 21-2. I think that's where Dr. Wood says, man, Revelation's like the tale of two cities. You know, it's, it's a tale of two women. On, on the Babylonian side, the, the figure is personified as a prostitute. Uh, on the God side, she's portrayed as a bride of Christ. You know, it, it's the structure of the book. It's, it's taking shape. And something different does happen in chapter 12 when John takes a break from, from the cycles and get so, you know, and, and as you get the structure, as you start climbing the floors, hopefully I can see out a little bit farther because now we're up in a few upper floors. And just a reminder in Revelation, worship is war. Yes. And, and who you worship should be as obvious as if it was stamped on my head. You know, and we'll get to that in the series. Who I'm going to bow down to. That, that indicates whose side I'm on. Which of those trinities do I belong to? Which city? do I belong to? And that whole 12, 13, all that whole section of the, the book, it's right back into one of those cycles that you talked about. Because in chapter 12, Satan is introduced. He emerges. In chapter 13, his two beast buddies are introduced. They emerge. Chapter 13, or chapter 14, Babylon comes onto the scene. And then he goes right back. 17 and 18, Babylon is destroyed. Chapter 19, the two beasts are destroyed. Chapter 20, Satan is destroyed. They are introduced and then disposed of in reverse order. The destruction of Babylon, it's a key point. And if you're one of the first people, you're the first century, and, and you're living in this conflict, and you know that Satan and the beasts and all that, but you know what you see? You see Rome. You see the emperor. That's what you see. The behind the scenes, the, the spiritual warfare. That's the same thing Paul described in Ephesians 6. Put on the full armor, Vacation Bible School, Ephesians 6.10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And I was like, I got to be able to see what's going on behind what I see every day. And Revelation is just, I'm using an illustration here. It's rising as a building, another building. You got 27 buildings in your New Testament. It's all facets of the same war. You got 66 buildings in your, in your Bible, 66 books. And, and Revelation, the last one, going all the way back to the first one, Genesis, that we had in, in the meditation. The dragon in Revelation is a serpent. In Genesis, it's, it's the same antagonist we've been fighting the whole way through. The structure of this book says, there's a war. Who do I worship? You know, and war is one of those words, right? Context. We've got military people here. You've got to quantify what you mean by war. Athletes get caught up in heat of the moment, the passion. We're going to war. And somebody says, mm, you're not. You know? It's emotional. Um, there's pain. There's risk involved, I get that. But in the end, it's not a war. Now this in Revelation, this is the war. This is the war. This is the ultimate war. Whose side am I on? That's the key question. And probably for you and me, are, are probably our day-to-day, -day, I feel like it's probably somewhere between sports and end times. <laughs> it's, it's, it's more than a game, you know, but it's not, it's really not the end. You know? And, and maybe sometimes that's how we feel. You know, I, man, I kind of feel like John. You know, I'm, I'm on the island of Patmos, and I'm in the middle of this struggle. 
And I really wish I could get a vision from God. And you want God to, you want God to see the war. It's like, God, do you see what's going on in my battle? And that's where we're going to finish. You're going you're to get all the way up to the top floor. That, will this be the penthouse view, I guess? No. What God sees. And God is asking, where are you? In your struggle today, where are you? What are you battling? What are you seeing? What are you feeling? I don't know, how many, how many mornings do you wake up like, which of Satan's beasts am I going to run into today? You know, how many residents of Babylon am I going to have to deal with today? You know, it happens to us every week. There, there, every week there is a portion in our group, whether you're talking about our congregation or the communities at large, who are battling sickness and disease. Every week. There, not a week goes by that I don't, or somebody sends you some health-related prayer request. It's part of the battle. Death has visited again you know, in recent weeks, both our church and in our community. You know, and sometimes it's very hard. God, do you see where I'm at in the battle? How, how can I see what, what you're doing? Because all I can see in my eye now is the loss and the grief. I don't know how to respond to that. And, and for some people, it's, it's a relationship friction. That's right. and, and some of those are the same people. In the middle of the loss and the death is the fighting and the friction and that frustration. And, I, you know, way back, I wonder if somebody says, yeah, you had that little joke about the husband and the potato chips, but, yeah, he's really that clueless. He really is. You know? Talk about how the brain's wired. There's no wiring in there at all. No. No. Somebody's listening to all this going, man, we're in like the first month of school, and we've already had multiple visits to the principal. It's going to be a year. You know? God, what do you have for me in that? Because that's what I see day to day. And for some people, it's like anxiety, just the stress. You see, you see the culture, oh, just the changes. And just, I told somebody this week in my office, I just watch less and less news because it's just entirely depressing. I don't know if maybe we feel a lot like the, the first century people reading this letter and like, God, the there's a lot that's collapsing, and I feel like you're silent. Have, have you sequestered yourself? If you look out there, it looks like the emperor's winning. You know, it's not real far-fetched for us to be able to look at the first century people and see, you know, God, what did you see? Because they're seeing Rome and everything that it was becoming and doing. All I want you know, I just want to leave it. We have not read to the end of the book yet. <laughs> Part of these weekly, daily assignments that you have, if you're following through, we're not to the top floor yet. We're not at Revelation 21. We're not at Revelation 22. God's going to take us up there. And if you watch, I think, what is it, Dead Poets Society, where Robin Williams, I didn't watch, but he, I know he had the, the students stand on the desk. He's like, come up here and, and change your perspective. And that's what God's going to do at the end of Revelation. Come up here and look at your world from my perspective. Okay? Here's how it looks from my angle up here. You know, and I just took a picture that Lazarus used when he's standing on top of that building they're building. Here's how it looks from the top looking down. And I got to get to the end because when I remember, when I read to the end and I remember that God wins, then that's what helps give me confidence and assurance that I can win. And I, winning makes me think of coaching. Do, do I want to be a coach who is a part of a state title winning team? Yes, I do. You know? And I know there are people in this room that have that feeling. They know how that feels. And if I could just go to practice and say, I've seen it. I've been there. I have a revelation well, I have a sure and certain glimpse of that future. I just go to practice and go, ladies, we win. You know? And I don't know how, how much more willing do you think all of us would be, players, coaches, parents, if I could travel into the future and say this is what it looks like when you're standing. That is last year's Division Three girls championship team. You know, medals around their necks. I'm going to say that that might make all the practice and the sore muscles, and the frustration, and the blood, and the bad calls, and the fighting with the coach, and the long bus rides, and all that stuff, a lot more manageable. You know? And it's not going to erase all the pain, but it sure would help if I could remember 
what comes out of the effort. You know, I can't I can't guarantee that to the players. You know, but we can guarantee it to the people. You know, that's what Revelation is doing. You know, to see it, we we have to recognize the way the book is structured. Let's pray and we'll close for today. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your word that has endured through all the ages and just the centuries of Satan's questions. And we are grateful for efforts to wrestle with it, to interpret it, uh, to apply it to our lives. Uh, Father, we know that we're going to leave the, the comforts of this room and very soon, if not immediately, be thrust back into the reality where it looks like all we can see is the victory of Satan and the world. And we pray that we can have the vision uh, to be able to see what you see, uh, to be able to trust your plan and your purpose unfolding. Thank you for the willingness of our body to work through these things. And we pray that you will continue to teach us this week and beyond. It's in Jesus' name, amen. And we will continue to invite you to uh, your own decision to say, maybe you've said, I, know, I, I, I need the Lord. I just know that is primary for today as I work towards eternity. This is a decision that I have to make to give my life to him to be immersed. This is the invitation, just as I am, 488. Let's stand together if you would. continue with our Revelation study up here for uh, session three with Dr. Wood this morning at 11. You're welcome to be in here for that. And then we're headed over to Travis's place uh, this afternoon, four o'clock and on. We'll start fishing at four and we'll end fishing at whatever minute sundown is. Okay, whenever, whatever your phone says the sun sets, that'll be the last minute. And I know Rick's sitting here with a shirt that's Fishing, don't let him intimidate you. Okay? He, he, he told me he can't even go because he has to deliver some stuff somewhere else. So, so don't feel like I can't compete because the guy's wearing a fishing shirt. That's just a happy coincidence. So you're all invited. You don't have to fish. You can come and sit. And we got uh, hot dogs and buns and water and s'more stuff. And just if you want to, whatever you want to bring. And we'll sit out there together. 
and spend some time, play some games. So we'll start out there at four, and then coming up this week is their women's, women's Bible study is Thursday. Thursday here at six. And then next Sunday, you'll probably start seeing some enlargements of family photos for our next series that's starting in a couple weeks, just trying to cross that generational gap there. So grandparents who have already sent me things that I asked for, I've blown those up. So that's why you see certain ones. Um, maybe for your family, maybe you're the grandchild or the m middle generation. If you have a picture of your generations that you want to send, feel free to email that to me or get that to me and we'll enlarge some and put them out in the foyer. So you might see those next week and you'll see a box that is for cards and or financial donations for the family, the Smith family in the village who has suffered a loss of their husband and their father. Um, there are five kids. Um, they're teenagers, some of them I know, but if you don't know how to help, we don't, it's really hard, you know, to know how to help. And I think financial gifts, will put all that together, um, one check from the church, any gift card, especially if you're, you young guys, you know what kids like to eat, what restaurants, you know, if you just want to get some of those and drop them in that box, we'll put all that together in an envelope and take it to their family. So hopefully that can be one way. We'll have a card from the congregation you can sign. So look for that next week, maybe the next couple of weeks, there'll be a box out in the foyer. Is there anything else? That's Children's church meeting on next Sunday. Okay, here. children's church workers, or if you're interested, next Sunday here in between worship and Sunday school right here in the front by Carrie. <coughs> thank you. Did you pray for us? Yep. Father in heaven, thank you again for this time to come worship and to just um, be in your presence and, and hear your word. Father, I ask that you uh, be with us this week and uh, help us come back next week if it's your will. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.